Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the International Council of Chemical Associations and Chemie Hoch 3, a German expression to say it's the sustainability in initiative of the German chemical industry, I have the honor to welcome you to this side event today. So thank you for coming at 3 p.m. just after the lunch break. We will discuss today uh, around the headline, Making Our Impacts Measurable and Transparent, Contributions of the Chemical Sector to the SDGs, another acronym meaning Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, my name is Andrea Bacher, I'm an Environment and Energy Consultant and I have the uh, privilege to moderate uh, today's event. Um, as I already mentioned, we will discuss today several topics. Uh, existing and new approaches to measure sustainability is a, a topic very important to all of us about da data transparency. And we will hear some concrete examples and best practices from the chemical sectors, um, how they contribute to the SDG, but also specifically to climate actions and climate solutions. Um, and we will have a short overview also in a more generic uh, way um, how the German industry is dealing with the SDGs and climate action. Before we start now our discussion, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists uh, from, the, from my left to right. Uh, Stefan Haver, chairman of the VZE, the German Chemicals Association Sustainability Board, and also the representative of Chemie Free. Um, and also the head of corporate responsibility of Evonik, one of the largest uh, specialty chemical enterprises in the world. Uh, Jorge Soto, just uh, next, uh, is leading, amongst others, the environment and energy climate work of the International Council of Chemical Associations and is the director of sustainable development of Bra Braskem, the largest biopolymer company in the world. And Jorge will explain later also in more detail uh, their work. Um, Aruna Bagosh is the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Uh, he's one of the leading experts on data, uh, but he's also uh, writing many publications around climate change and environment and advising uh, the government in India. Uh, Laura Schneider is the project manager for Econsense, uh, the forum for uh, sustainable development of German business. And last but not least, Enrico Robertus, project director of the Global Carbon Market and Technical Support Unit of the Nitric Acid Climate Action Group, in short, NACAG, I hope I, I spell it correctly, of GIZ, which is the German Development Corporation uh, arm. So now ahead of our panel discussion, and before we go deeper into discussion of uh, quite some complex topics, we will start with two overview presentation. We will start first with Jorge giving you an overview of the role of the chemical sector in achieving the SDGs. And we will then hear from Adunaba on the need for solid data uh, to measure sustainability. Jorge. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. I'm very happy to be talking with you on behalf of ICCA the International Council of, of Chemical Associations. Uh, well, Andre, the, the idea is to give you a, a review of the role of the chemical industry on achieving the sustainable development goals, but uh, with some uh, deeper discussion about the relationship uh, of the SDGs with the climate change, of course. We are in a climate change conference. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Ah, I should Sorry for that. Well, uh, first, some words about the ICCA. Um, the International Council of Chemicals, Chemical Associations is the voice of the global chemical industry. Um, it has members of around the world, as you see in the slide. Um, mostly, the chemical companies and associations are members. About 90% of the whole sales on chemicals are members of uh, the ICCA. And uh, a very important program of um, initiative from the ACCA is uh, the responsible care. And that's uh, why, how we uh, contribute for, to the sustainability side. Uh, this uh, responsible care was established in, during the 80s and 90s, the next century, but it's still ongoing on having more and more members. Um, in, in 2014, 
and they have the we have the launched the global charter a new one and uh, explicit uh, the contribution for the sustainability side is there so uh, today about 96 percent of the largest chemical companies in the world uh, are signed uh, signed this uh, global charter um, you know, uh, probably almost uh, all of you already have heard about um, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this is um, the agenda of uh, the UN for 2030, uh, putting all the challenges of the sustainability together and uh, in putting all the agents, uh, all the actors uh, to work together uh, um, for achieving those uh, challenges and in, in objectives. Uh, there are 17, and most of them uh, we see that the chemical industry could uh, contribute. For example, for reducing the hunger, uh, you see the packaging or the agriculture uh, being improved by using chemicals or using plastics, uh, or uh, uh, giving access to water, for example, or reducing you know, or improving the health. So a lot of uh, ways of uh, the chemical that the chemicals could help the whole uh, challenges, uh, set of challenges of the sustainable development goals. One of them is the uh, climate change, of course. So we are, uh, we will discuss a little bit more about this. Uh, this is how we and uh, the chemical industry um, understand that we could contribute uh, or with our own uh, products. Uh, when we offer those products to the society, the value chains, we could, of course, work, uh, help the health and the well-being um, with uh, medicines, for example, uh, do with the, working with the sustainable uh, production and consumption partners. Uh, certainly, we will help uh, that uh, specific objective, and but also the reduction of uh, energy consumption or resource consumption, uh, etc to work uh, with the, the environmental and energy efficiency also is a way uh, of uh, improving the climate change issues. So all the, the efforts that the chemical industry could uh, uh, offer solutions, we are working on. Uh, not only for the um, environmental side, but also for the society side, as you see some others uh, uh, past like sustainable uh, uh, economy or or like partnerships uh, or given an example ICCA has a partnership with the UN Environment uh, Agency in order to improve the chemicals uh, management around the world so uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that we, we could say that this is how in, in the economic industry is contributing for the sustainability and for the sustainable development goals uh, specifically for the climate change, uh, we could say that we, the chemical industry is working in, on the improvement of its uh, uh, own footprint. As here you see three graphs, and a, a global one uh, that's um, saying that about 50% uh, of improvement on the intensity of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but we are, could say that this is a global figure that is changing uh, through the time because every year you, we have more members in the, in, in the International Chemical uh, uh, Council of uh, uh, Associations. So uh, these figures is uh, very general, but it could, be, could change uh, as, much, as much more members we have. But the others, we, you could see the Brazilian one and also the Brazilian one. And then is the, the set of uh, members is more uh, stable. And you can see even that there is a, a real uh, improvement, uh, import, important improvement of the, our uh, footprint. Uh, but not only for the past, we are working also in the future. Uh, uh, this is a study uh, that was uh, conducted by the CAMA and, and uh, ICCA. Uh, with other partners, and especially I, IEA, uh, in 2013. And we studied uh, the most important uh, major products uh, manufacturers uh, in energy intensity. Uh, and um, we selected uh, some of them, 18 of, 18 of them, and we arrived to the conclusion that using uh, catalysts, uh, the process could be improved. 
uh, in by 2050, uh, about 50% of the greenhouse uh, emissions could be reduced using this kind of process. Of course, for that, it's not ready. We should invest uh, in, in innovation and in improvement of the processes, uh, also in investments. So it's not ready for the use, but it's really an opportunity for the future. Uh, and also, on the other hand, we are working also in the handprint. The handprint uh, uh, is uh, the, the way that we could help the society to reduce uh, their, its own, their emissions of the society. And uh, since 2009, we are working on that. Uh, I'm seeing my friend, uh, uh, Russell Mills, that was leading this first work in 2009, that arrived to the conclusion for, uh, that was what, uh, conducted by McKinsey. And the work arrived to the conclusion that for each emissions that happened during the production phase of the chemical industry, 2.1 to 2.6 emissions are reduced in the whole value chain. So the use of chemicals could help us to reduce the emissions. And with the same idea, we uh, investigated the uh, building sector. The building sector is very important because about 30% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are uh, emitted by this sector. And, and, and uh, the conclusion was that by 2050, uh, about 12 to 30, uh, 20, 23% uh, could be reduced in this sector using better uh, chemical products to isolation and except many other applications that could help this sector to reduce its own uh, emissions. When, uh, when we were working on that, we arrived to the conclusion that this concept of uh, avoided emissions was very important. So we decided to, uh, with, together with uh, WBCCD, to produce a guideline on how to use this concept of avoided emissions. And in this uh, the same year, in 2013, we issued uh, 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 the first set of examples. Uh, cases for around the world, and this year we, was, uh, uh, we have selected on new cases, and you could see in the internet uh, soon, the probably next week, uh, se 17 cases around the world that could show you specific examples of how to the chemical products would help to avoid emissions. Uh, I'll give you examples very subtly, you will uh, realize how this idea is very, um, very easy. Uh, reduction of the high light of the cars will reduce their consumption of the uh, fuel, so the emissions will re be re reduced. This is uh, only uh, one example, very easy to understand that this concept is very important. Uh, and Going forward on this, uh, on this, uh, the use of this concept, we have uh, uh, launched it uh, last week, not uh, about uh, two weeks ago, uh, with ECOFIS, uh, a new study. We have selected the six sectors uh, on uh, to be to be analyzed, uh, and the, how this six sector could. Uh, what would happen is if these uh, six applications, six solutions on um, lighting, for example, or on uh, renewable energy production, uh, generation, uh, six sectors were analyzed, and if those six sectors uh, were um, conducted until the, their full potential, uh, we arrived to the conclusion that uh, about more, more than nine gigatons of CO2 could be, could be avoided. Uh, this, uh, this nine gigatons is about the whole emissions of uh, the USA, uh, so it's a very important amount. So this is another way of seeing that how the chemical products could be a solution for, for, for reducing the society emissions. So with that, uh, I arrived to the conclusion for my introduction. Uh, you could see that we are at the global chemical industry committed to strengthen our, our uh, contribution for sustainable development, also, of course, for the Agenda 2030 and to the low carbon economy. Uh, you have uh, seen some examples of how uh, the um, global footprint or the local footprint of the chemical industry is improving, and also how we are working on improvement of the handprint. All of those, uh, it's very important, the use of uh, real good measurements, real good methodology, a very transparent way in order to, to demonstrate that this is really happening. And uh, I'm sure that uh, with uh, appropriate policies, we could improve this contribution. Uh, especially if we foster uh, 
cost-effective uh, based uh, solutions based on life cycle analysis, and supporting, of course, the use of uh, uh, standards for energy efficiency, and of course, the support of innovation and technology in order to those ideas or those first ideas who really from the chemicals uh, from the chemistry people could really become a product in the in the in the market base because we uh, certainly with the, our innovation we could bring new solutions for the society thank you for your attention thank you very much Jorge so you have already heard the many uh, contributions the chemical sector is bringing to the climate and sustainability uh, agenda. Um, there's much more. We will hear more a little bit later. And now I would pass the microphone directly to Adonaba for more details on data measurement transparency. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my uh, deep uh, thanks to ICCA and the German Chemicals Industries Association for inviting me here to address you. I'm not going to talk so much about the chemical industry. I will refer to it a little bit, but you're the experts. I'm going to talk about data. Um, and the presentation I want to give to you, the provocation I want to put before you is, is or can data drive sustainable development? And if so, how? And I'm going to try to illustrate this with four stories from India of how we are trying to use data to drive our sustainable development trajectory. I represent the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. We are an independent policy research institution ranked as South Asia's leading think tank and amongst the world's leading climate think tanks. As you can see, our work uh, covers on the energy side, energy access, renewables, and the power sector, but more broadly on the industrial development side, industrial sustainability, about which we'll talk, uh, low carbon pathways, long-term low carbon pathways, the risks and adaptation to climate change, and of course, technology and finance that will facilitate that. Now, over the course of the next three decades, India is going to go through what we call four energy transitions. And I particularly use the example of India because it will be the most important energy player in the global energy markets over the next three decades. Even though China is a bigger energy market, China's curve will begin to flatten while India's will continue to rise. Now, what are those four energy transitions? The first is going to be the shift from traditional to modern sources of energy. And I'll talk about that in more detail when I talk about data. The second is going to be the shift from rural sources of energy demand to a more urbanized economy, probably about 600 million people transitioning into urban areas over these three decades. The third, and as that graph shows, our deeper integration into global energy markets from a position of relative autarky. So where we are currently in terms of per capita income, uh, our energy footprint is not that different. I don't know whether you can see it the, uh, in, in terms of what, uh, in relation to what other advanced economies have gone through. But the question is, as we become a richer economy, will we be energy profligate like the North American countries, or more energy efficient, like European or East Asian economies. Um, and the fourth energy transition is going to be trying to, do, uh, trying to have growth with sustainability within the carbon constraint. Now, the four examples I'm going to use in terms of use of data is going to try and illustrate how we are trying to manage these energy transitions. And hopefully, that will also illustrate to you the role of data in the, in the sectors that you're operating. So let me start with the first story, the shift from traditional to modern energy. If we want to electrify every single household in India over the next two or three years, we basically have to be electrifying nearly three million households um, on, on a monthly basis. That's a phenomenal rate of electrification that needs to happen. But what do we mean by energy access? At CEW, we decided to create the world's largest data set on energy access using multiple dimensions of, of energy access, whether it's access in terms of the connection, the reliability, the affordability, the quality of, of energy services delivered, even the health and safety of it. And as a result, you see that in, in many cases, while we claim that many, uh, many villages are electrified, 
most rural households are still what we, in what we call tier zero of, of energy access in a graded tier of tier one, two, three, four. And a similar story applies on cooking energy access. Now, what do you do with that data? When we look at this data we have this, with this largest data set, we are able to then hone in on the particular states where you have a problem, and you figure out why do you have the problem. Is it a problem of the connections are not there, or is it because the dura duration of electricity supplied is not there, or the quality of power supplied is poor, et cetera? And therefore, you're able to hone in on the problem you want to solve. And then you drill deeper into the habitation level. We have more than 600,000 villages. So if you want to electrify every household, you can't have a single rule book of how to do that. You need to understand at each village level, within the village, a habitation, within the habitation, the household, what is the problem that you need to solve. And it's, that's the basis on which we are able to then help the government decide, do you need to send in a contractor with a wire? Do you need to send in a van to fix something? That degree of precision allows you to use big data to deliver energy services to the poor. Similarly, that map demonstrates how data can be used to massively deploy solar irrigation across the country. We mapped out every single district in the country in t on, on the basis of 10 different parameters to look at where you get the maximum returns of investment uh, or in terms of deploying solar-based uh, solar irrigation. So this is the first story on energy access being driven through big data. The second transition was that from rural to urban energy demand, and this is where the chemicals industry will also have a role. India has rolled out um, more than 270 million light bulbs in the span of about the last two and a half years. How do we do that? We did it by offering a large advanced market commitment from the government that we are going to procure these efficient lighting products from private sector manufacturers, regardless of whether they're Indian or foreign manufacturers. And that large market promise has driven down the price of a light bulb from more of an LED light bulb from more than 300 rupees about two and a half years ago to less than 40 rupees a few months ago. Now, that graphic is actually from an app uh, that you can download on your phone and gives you on 10 second intervals, the number of light bulbs that are being procured and distributed to households. And you can then map out not just bulbs distributed, but energy savings, emissions reduction, and so forth. But as we shift towards an urban energy pattern, we're also going to need, uh, like the COP venue here, much more efficient heating and cooling services. Uh, <clears throat> now, as a result, the need for the HFCs as refrigerants was likely to be a major cause for concern, not just for India, but for the world as a whole. But we didn't have any India numbers. We only had extrapolations or interpolations from global numbers of what economy like India would undergo in terms of HFC emissions. So again, at, what, at CEW, what we did was undertake the first modeling exercise of HFC emissions, and, and not just in room and mobile air conditioning, but across 16 different subsectors, which allowed us to give a precision to the growth of emissions, going up from just 3 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to up to 500 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, or accounting for about 5% of our GHG emissions in 2050. That then became the basis for India to come forward with its own amendment proposal in the Montreal Protocol, which resulted in the Kigali Amendment last year. And that graphic shows you that compared to the 500 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent of HFC emissions, we can now have a pathway driving it down to near zero. The third major transition is from India's relative autarky in global markets to much deeper integration. Now, of course, people tend to think of that in terms of our crude oil imports or natural gas imports or coal imports. But I'm going to talk about the deeper integration into global energy and global financial markets. We have offered one of the world's largest renewable energy markets. 175,000 megawatts of renewable energy is going to be deployed by 2022. What India is trying to do with renewables in a span, a span of seven years is what took Germany more than two decades to achieve. And of course, India is trying to do it at a much lower level of income. 
Now, last May, well, May before last, in 2016, one of our states, Telangana, had one of the lowest bids for solar power in the world. But when we looked at that bid, we saw that the bid in the same week in Dubai was half that value. So India's bid was about six US cents, Dubai was at about three US cents. So my colleague here, Kanika Chavla, who leads our renewable energy program, was tasked by our Minister for Renewable Energy to figure out why was this happening. And as that graphic shows you, that it's not the cost of the panel, the module, or the O&M, or even the balance of systems, it is the cost of finance. Now, we, are un we can't work uh, towards a major renewable energy transition unless we're able to shave off that cost of finance. Now, this May, a whole year later, our value dropped from six US cents to just over three US cents. And as you can see, it's not the cost of the technology that has dropped so much in 12 months, it's the cost of finance that we've been able to bring down in, in, in India. How does this again link to the chemicals industry? We were hearing earlier about the rollout of renewables. The next big stage is going to be renewables with energy storage, where again, chemicals will have a role. So maybe the technology prices will go up, or maybe the cost of finance for energy storage would have to be brought down. Again, this is the use of data at a very granular level to be able to deliver the kind of solutions we want. So finally, I'm going to come to the industrial sector. How do we grow? How do we make manufacture in India with sustainability? In India, the industrial sector accounts for a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. And as you can see, chemicals industry is the, is the third largest after iron and steel and, and, and on ferrous mineral, minerals. So there's an opportunity for deep decarbonization. But there's a problem as well. We are a growing economy and we are a growing manufacturing economy. So how do we make an India while also trying to fulfill our NDC commitments? And where does data fit in? What we did again at CEW was build up the largest database of industrial emissions in India, far more than the government of India or even industrial associations have. How did we do it? We looked at not a sample of industries, we looked at the entire set of large industries in India, nearly 200,000 plants, and used there and looked at nearly 90 different fuel types for each stage of the, of the of industrial processes to get to a much granular estimate of industrial emissions. Now you can see that over the course of the last decade or so, our industrial emissions have had a compounded annual growth rate of about 9%. But that's not what the real story is. The real story is when we compare our numbers, which we believe to be far more granular and accurate, with what was being reported earlier. Not because we were trying to fudge numbers, it's simply we didn't get it right. In 2007, when we produced our first inventory of sorts, uh, we actually overestimated our industrial emissions by nearly 100 million tons, because we were taking a small set sample and extrapolating. In 2011-12, we are much closer to accuracy. But the real story here then is that that accuracy allows you to use government policy for energy efficiency and emissions intensity reduction with more precision for sectors, subsectors, and at a plant level. If you don't do that, you're offering general kind of policy direction, which makes it very difficult for businesses to deal with. So what we have, uh, what we have ended up with is that fuel carbon intensity of major industries has kind of remained the same even though there is a, a shift towards using natural gas in some of the major industries and substituting for coal. And while the fuel mix uh, in many industries remains the same, the energy efficiency is being driven through market competition. So I've given you four stories of India's energy transitions, many of which have an implication with the chemicals industry, whether it is energy access for the poorest, using the largest database of energy access in the world, whether it is the urban patterns of energy demand, say HFC emissions, again, building up a database of how to drive it down. Whether it is our deeper integration into global energy and financial markets for our renewables transition, or whether it is our industrial efficiency and emissions reduction. It is the use of data that is driving these massive transformations in the Indian economy. I'm gonna close with a cartoon from nearly a century and a half, more than a century and a half ago, 
from Vanity Fair magazine. That cartoon shows whales are having a party. Because in 1861, until 1861, whale blubber was the main source of electricity, of lighting, not electricity, of lighting. And then they found oil in Pennsylvania. So suddenly, whales didn't have to be culled and, and, and killed. Uh, and instead, you had a different energy source. When we look at disruption in energy markets or in technology markets, we know that there will always be some winners and some losers. In this case, the whales won and had a party. Uh, now, the losers are going to be the fossil fuel industry, but we can only have a structured strategic transition if we use data. Carpe diem, carpe datum. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Adel Naba, for, for your inspiring presentation. Um, you said something towards the end, which I think we are, we are all discussing in these two weeks, and not just these two weeks, is how to grow sustainable. We all know that demographic growth is, is uh, going forward. In positive scenario, it will have its peak uh, in 2050. In the negative prognosis, we go towards end of the century, which means more products, more needs. Uh, in the same time, we need to reduce at least by one third by 2050 the emissions. So there's much we need to do. And so I'd like to come back now to uh, two concrete examples before we debate on uh, what has already been done and what projects are underway. And I'd like to, to give the word first to St uh, Stefan Hava to tell us a bit more about uh, Chemie uh, 3. Yeah, thank you. Chemical 3. Um, maybe to start, because, because it was really impressive what we've seen here. So before I launch into Chemical 3, let me just start with one word here, which is um, to, out to everybody who has been involved in making the impacts of sustainability to measurable over the last years, we definitely owe you a lot. And if I just think back, and this now comes directly to what chemicals, uh, Chemical uh, Power 3 is all about, uh, when we think back just to 20 years ago when people <laughs> thought about sustainability, most of them uh, would have perceived the chemical business more as a part of the problem than a solution uh, provider. And this has tremendously changed. And not because we, uh, we've done an outstanding job in marketing and communication, but because we've really learned our lesson. And this is here, measurability is, is the, the most important point and factor, as to the day, sustainability so often is like trying to get into grips with the Holy Ghost. And we don't even know exactly what we're talking about. It's so important to really exactly show what the impacts are, where the impacts um, occur, and to differentiate between the footprint part and the handprint part. These are the absolute essentials. Now, coming to uh, Chemicals Power 3, the point is for um, us as the bigger players in the market and the, for, the, for the global companies, it's relatively easy to have access to big data, um, to have the budgets and the resources to do all kinds of uh, research that we need. Now, if you trickle down to the uh, uh, small and mid-sized companies, uh, the picture is all different. And it's not because those companies are not willing to get themselves on the sustainability pathway, but because it's simply because they don't have the tools and the methodologies. So I guess, I mean, one of the um, really outstanding ideas with Chemicals Power 3 was to build a strong partnership together with... Um, the, um, the, the worker council and representatives on the one uh, hand side and the industry partners on the other hand side to um, join forces and to give tools and methodologies that we build in the bigger companies to those small size medium companies as well who don't have the means. Um, and I guess this is something that works pretty well. We don't have to be over optimistic because it takes some time until these tools are really um, spread in the industry. But at least what we've given to, um, to uh, this branch is that there is now a clear set of, um, of numbers and of uh, metrics that is easy to use for almost everybody. I guess that's the, the most important thing here. Thank you very much. So um, to come quickly to our second uh, example, Enrico, you are heading the Nitric Acid Climate Action Project. Um, so perhaps you can tell us, first of all, what is Nitric Acid and why this is, of course, so important that the German Development Corporation is, is leading it. Um, and also, how do you measure plan 
uh, and, and uh, make assessments on your impacts at the end. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk about the Nitric Asset Climate Action Group initiative of the German government really briefly today. Um, the Nitric Asset Climate Action Group was launched by the German government and the very important letter in this acronym is the G for the group. So it's a global approach. We're trying to um, tackle one very specific chemical sector. That's why I'm here today, chemical industry, and it's nitric acid production. Nitric acid production, some of you might know it. It's a very um, important, um, uh, um, important substance in the chemical industry. And while producing nitric acid, you have N2O emissions. And N2O emissions, people coming to the COP know them probably as well. It's a very harmful greenhouse gas. It has the 265 potential of CO2 emissions. So um, we have a real, um, let's say, in, in climate change terms, dangerous production here. And, and um, the German government would like to see um, that, um, that this, tech, that this uh, problem is tackled at a global scale. Why did they choose the chemical sector and this specific sector, the N2O, product, uh, the N2O sector? Um, some of you probably know the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, which was a very important and successful mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, a market mechanism. And the NTO sector was also very successful in this sector. So um, if you produce N2, uh, nitric acid, you have the N2O emissions, and there is technology actually at hand and also um, already installed in many plants around the world, which helps you to abate these emissions. These are catalysts. They're used in Europe and other parts of the world, and um, the costs to install these, these catalysts are comparatively low, um, comparatively low to the mitigation impact you get. So um, basically, you can say it's a low-hanging fruit of mitigation um, abatement possibility. And the CDM was able to um, incentivize the private sector pretty well, um, um, and around the globe, we had probably around 80 projects um, installing with the, with the incentive of the CDM money, um, these uh, technologies in their plans and successfully abating um, N2O emissions. So now with the prices in the CDM and the certificates coming down, we can see that um, these installations are not used anymore and, and because basically, and that's fine, it's a market approach, the, the private sector doesn't have an incentive anymore to, to do so. And that's now where the German government would like to step in and say, let's wait. Um, this is a very important sector, and, and as a pre-2020 action, even we would like to show that we tackle the sector and we make sure that the technology is again installed and, and used to abate these very harmful emissions. And in order to do so, we have now sent the German government, the Environment Ministry, who is um, head of the, the initiative, but as I said, we would like to have other governments join. Um, our minister sent now a letter to, um, to 32 countries where we have nitric acid production, and we have a very simple offer for them. We basically say if the country agrees um, upon the condition that they will be responsible for the sector after 2021, or after 2020, basically with the, implementation, with the start of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So if the country takes over ownership, and of course the industry in the country as well, if they say yes, we would be able to, from 2020 onwards, regulate the sector and, and make sure that the emissions are abated, then the German government will fund uh, the complete installation of abatement technology in that country. And that can come up, depending on the country, to a couple of millions each plant. And that's the prop proposition at the table at the moment. This letter was sent out basically recently, and we get a lot of interesting feedback from countries, a lot of countries, Latin American countries, but also Asian countries and North African countries um, are interested. They think it's an interesting approach. We support them basically to basically bring the sector state of the art in terms of abatement technology, but not only the technology, but also the capacity development with the plant operator. So we will support them on the technical issues to install and to run the technology. We will even fund stuff at the plant level, um, which will be in charge of the technology and then be probably then um, taken over by the plant operators themselves. We will support the governments on the policy design on how to regulate the sector later on. So we give a whole, whole, um, whole approach to, to make the sector state of the art running and working with the abatement technology. And then if everything runs, they take over and, and have the responsibility to keep going. I think for this session also interesting is to mention that we are coming from the CDM. And, and as I mentioned already, and you know, in the CDM, we had a lot of methodologies to monitor and, and verify the emission reductions. We want to keep this going. 
So we will use, still use the CDM uh, methodologies. We will even register in countries where we don't have a project yet, the CDM project. We will register the whole CDM cycle and install the monitoring equipment. So all this will also be taken care of because we also believe, as Mr. Gosch, that the data is very important to showcase and really have certified emission reductions at the table. Um, to showcase how much, how many reductions we were able to achieve until 2020, for example. All the certificates coming out of these projects will be cancelled at the UN level. So they will be not used for any German targets. Um, they will be cancelled. They can be used for the national targets for the countries themselves. They can use them in their reporting in the NDC and so on. Um, but we really believe that it's important to have a methodology in place and use it to also compare the different countries and, and, and um, um, uh, make it more transparent. I would like to finish with, the, with one more important thing. So we have an innovation or a transformative uh, character in this initiative because basically we say um, we start the initiative with the countries together, we support them to get everything going and then they take over responsibility for the long term uh, in the sector. So I think that's the one interesting part about it. And the second interesting part about it is that we say we have a global approach. So we, we don't tackle only a few countries, basically we want to have see the vision of the initiative is to say until 2020, every nitric acid protection plant is equipped with abatement technology. And of course, there's other countries which we, which we wouldn't finance, but we are ready to support them on a technical basis. And the 32 countries my minister sent a letter to, these are countries we are ready to, to also provide with financial means. Yeah, I would close with this at the moment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Enrico. So uh, you've heard already now two examples on how existing measurements uh, are available. Um, now we go even a step further. So we spoke now about specific examples in sectors uh, on energy, on climate. Um, Laura Schneider is dealing, amongst others, with the SDGs and how can we measure the SDGs. Um, you're leading this within the, uh, the German business, uh, um, on the German business side. So how can this be made manageable? We know the SDGs are, there are 17 SDGs. Climate is one amongst the 17. Uh, there are many subcategories on measurement. Um, how do you break down on the one hand the global SDGs on the national level and how do you intend to feed it back? And also what we heard from everybody, how can we make measurements more, well, in the best case global, but at least international? Okay, I, I wish I could give you an answer on that. I probably can't, but um, at least I can uh, tell you something about um, what is currently happening. And I think uh, what we shouldn't, um, like why and why the SDGs, even though we cannot fully comprehend and measure them yet at a business level, why they are still really important. Um, and uh, as Andrea already said, so Econsense, we're a member-based organization and we have many members from different industry sectors among them are several companies from the chemical sector, but there are also all kinds of different uh, industries represented in our membership. So we um, tackle this question more from a general overview and we ask more what can companies in general do. And um, to start off with, I think with the SDGs, the first time we kind of have a shared um, narrative and the common language when we talk about sustainability and sustainable development. Um, before sustainable development, have was a text, it was an interpretation, it was a definition that was mostly um, really interpreted differently in different countries and different organizations. People would look at specific topics only and they would not um, see it as a comprehensive um, topic. Um, and now with the SDGs we really realize it's a global agenda, it's interlinked concerns. For example, climate change, without uh, combating climate change, without avoiding climate change, we cannot achieve any of the other SDGs. So this is what makes this really important. And um, when we now come to measuring it, of course we have um, many indicators given by the United Nations. I think there are actually for those 17 SDGs and the 169 targets, we have 231 indicators. And not all of those indicators can be used yet. Um, most of them, there is either, like there are only, I think, half of them have actually um, data and methodology available. Then there are some, there is a method but no data. And even some indicators were defined where there is neither method nor data available as of now. And then we, I mean, we are a German-based um, organization. So when we then have also indicators by the European, on the European level, 
Um, I think at the beginning of this year, the European uh, Union defined 100 more indicators um, of how to measure the SDGs. Um, and not all of them are actually in line with the ones that the UN proposed. So I think 50 new indicators uh, came to this um, yeah, pool of indicators. And then on the German level, for example, and I think this will happen in many of, um, uh, countries all over the world, they defined their own indicators as well. So we have 63 more indicators. And this is just uh, kind of the um, overall level. And this is like the economy-wide uh, indicators. And now when we look, go one step further, um, when we have business, and um, as we already heard um, quite impressive um, business and the industry has their own indicators to measure their sustainability performance. And there are several. There are several on the side on the environmental issues and there are also um, several on the side of um, how to assess social issues. And um, I think um, the big question that we're actually now here, and I think this is also where we as Econsen see our big um, impact that we can deliver, is how can we bring those together? How can we actually create an impact that those indicators that are already there are really usable, that they actually target what they're supposed to target and how can companies uh, with their measurements and with their indicators impact and actually pay into this whole overall national, European and global um, impact that is measured. And um, yeah, I think there, there are good, good, there are a lot of things that are happening now and a lot of initiatives where companies come together and we heard some of them and they measure their impacts. Um, and I think this will happen more and more as um, we want now have this common agenda and this common uh, language and, and actually also a really clear uh, set of targets, what we want to achieve at least. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, when we, what we have already heard, when we speak about measurement transparency, we speak of course also about trust. So having the trust with each other to building international comparable measurements, uh, enabling markets uh, to trade, um, find solution of course for competitiveness concern which are worldwide existing. We've just heard this this morning from, uh, from Argentina, who is also leading uh, B20 next year. Um, my question now to all panelists, I would say, is um, when we speak about measurement and transparency, of course, the key is, first of all, have access to data. Then when you have access, can you use the data? Um, and then also about data security. So my question to you is, what do, you, do you think we have the capacity in the majority of countries available to actually do that? And secondly, what role plays in your view, or does already in your companies, uh, play digitalization? So uh, what, what progress have you made in that, that direction? Perhaps Mr. Havers, if you would start. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the first thing here is that um, the companies who get into data and use data for their sustainability work, you can force them to do so, but they must do so for good business reason. So, I mean, um, what we've, see, we've seen for the example of India, making light bulbs cheaper is a brilliant way to just spread the news. So, I mean, the question is not only um, how to manage the data at hand, which I guess is not a problem, uh, neither from the data security part, because, I mean, all our companies, we have data security for the really sensitive part of our business. The more important part um, of the question is, how do we make sustainability part of our business? How do we integrate this into our business structure? Don't have this at a, as an add-on somewhere on the fringes, but right in the center of our business. If this is the case, case data is no problem. Data security is no problem, because this will be um, a direct result. So um, this matter of, of business integration is something that is, to me, is maybe the, the most important question right now. As I see it from our industry and many, many other industries, it's not so much about technologies, which are all at hand. It's not so much about data or data quality, but it's about the question how we remodel our business cases and how we can really prove and show that um, there is a business case for sustainability. And again, just um, to bring in chemical power three here again, I mean, this is um, the, the idea is, apart from giving a, a wider set of companies uh, the methodologies, to make the chances visible and to show that there is a way to integrate these uh, things, not just in you know, one corporate responsibility department, but as a cross function that is really earning money. So, um, in, 
in, in so far, it's not only just a matter of um, regulatory affairs or regulatory frameworks, but of business rationality. I will say that I could not agree more with Stefan. Um, uh, the, the real challenge is to integ the integration of the business side and the, and the sustainability in the business um, itself. Um, I will say that our example, our experience in Brascam, um, it's, it's really challenged to do that. Uh, we have defined uh, 10 uh, objectives, concrete objectives uh, to, through our business, for example, to, Im to improve the use of renewable sources or uh, for materials or for energy, uh, to improve the, the um, recycling of our products, uh, to uh, improve uh, the energy use, etc. A lot of um, uh, indicators and measurement came when you decide to do something. And, and I think that uh, you are totally correct. Uh, the, the, the most important uh, challenge is the first step to integrate, the integration. The measurement uh, will come. And I would say that there are a lot of tools already in the market that will help us. The, I think that uh, the future, uh, the integration between what the, the business are measuring and the country are measuring and the, the, the whole system is measuring it could be a, a challenge because the, the, the local uh, business uh, would need something very special. Uh, for example, uh, we see in India the uh, low carbon uh, new energy emissions would be needed there in India. Perhaps in Brazil we need more, for example, the water stress uh, access for water in some region of the, the, of the country. So the, the needs are very uh, particular, but the, the, this, all, the, all of this is sustainability. So uh, I think the, the largest challenge, uh, the biggest challenge will be um, the integration between the local and the in business side with the global uh, 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 path. But uh, I think we could manage that. Adonaba, what was your experience? You already uh, started actually doing practical no, I, I mean, as a, as a research institution, we obviously uh, uh, try to look at the most efficient way to get data. The most efficient way to get data is to get data that already exists. Uh, and then when you don't find that data, you, f you go and create new data. Um, so the question, I would reframe the question not so much as how secure the data is. That's a relevant question, but it's not the most important one. It's not how secure the data is, it is who secures the data. Right? The problem we've had with sustainability is we've tried to build it on an information architecture that is closed in historically, where you know, government controls data or companies control data for business security purposes. When you use new technology and open up the data sources and then use technology to crowd in multiple sources and triangulate that, so we are, we are our household surveys, it takes one hour to uh, survey a single household. It takes months to actually cover a certain state that might be affected by some security situation because our surveyors might be getting roughed up by some thugs on the road. So that's a long way of collecting deep data. But then you can marry it with prompt data in back from SMS-based surveys. And you can marry it with satellite-based uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, triangulation approaches. So what we've tried to do, whether it's on our energy access database, the industrial emissions database, our HFC database, uh, is constantly look, build on existing, crowd it in with new data, and then make everything transparent. And it goes back to what you just said uh, earlier. It all boils down to, can people trust your data? You know, there's a famous quip, President Lyndon Johnson was having a discussion with one of his economists in the President's uh, Advisory Council on the Economy. And you know, like economists, you know, he was being given on the one hand, on the other hand, that this is the range. And President Johnson being coming from Texas said, ranges are for cattle, give me a number, man. <laughs> so we can give a number, and you can make a policy based on that number, but as long as you're transparent about the number and the assumptions that go behind the number, that's when you will get trust. Um, so um, 
what we have been recently really discussing about, because of course digitalization um, is something, is one of those mega trends, maybe next to the SDGs that I would also like to call a mega trend, but um, so is how um, we can actually use it for sustainable development and how we can, can we make uh, digitalization as such more sustainable. And I think those are two sides that we have to address because as I, we just uh, heard here, I think digitalization and data availability will really help to achieve um, more sustainable solutions, also to link um, people better, to um, develop more new initiatives, partnerships that wouldn't have been possible before. But of course, on the other hand, this creates many um, problems with regard to um, what we heard, data valid validity, like the, can you trust the data or um, also data security, um, what do I actually want to ta tell about myself, my company, which data do I actually want to publish? Um, and I think those are um, challenges where we really probably need uh, new solutions and new approaches um, and not only look at what have we now and how can we improve it maybe, but build new um, and uh, yeah, better systems. We have just recently done a study how um, digital solutions can help to achieve the SDGs and actually we identified several um, examples in our member companies how this is already happening um, and all of them said actually that there's a huge potential um, to do more and to um, advance in this regard but um, that there are still so many limitations um, we also recently discussed for example about uh, what is the future of work and um, how will this look like um, what is um, what are like how do we how do we deal with fake news really? How are fake news are kind of affecting our society? So I think this is a more broader view than really an industrial perspective, but I think it all boils down um, to um, similar issues. And um, yeah, addressing this is a big challenge. And um, yeah, we're currently really, um, this is one of our focus topic because I think um, there's a huge potential and we should use it somehow, yeah. Enrico, maybe from the GSZ side, uh, maybe you have also already a program which is beyond your project, but for full GIZ, I suppose, on, on, on that topic. Oh, I, I'm sure we have. But I'm, I'm not aware of it right now. But I'd like to make an example on the CDM again. So, because the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, was a lot about data as well, and was very often criticized as well for the transaction costs we had, because um, a lot of the, the transaction costs came actually from all the monitoring and the verification of the data. So we had third parties coming into the projects and then measuring and sometimes these third parties came all the way from Germany. Maybe that's not necessary in the future. So, But what I want to say, I think it's very good to have a third party verification, for example, to, to really verify the data. And it's really worthwhile as well to to have, um, have the data measured and monitored. And, um, I think, I think in the future we can certainly bring down the transaction costs on the data measurement because digitalization and so on technologies will help us to do so. But I really think the CDM showed as well that it's, uh, it's very important to have the data because you could show the impact it had. And, and the numbers we have are pretty good to showcase what's, what's really happened on the ground. And, um, and I think the, um, um, it also showed that, that um, then the investment, you know, if, if you invest into it, and you can really showcase what what your impact was. Of course, the investment it's it's more attractive for the for the investor to do so. So um, and one other part I would like to mention as well, also from the GIZ perspective, maybe it's the capacity development. So I, I really think it's not everywhere the capacity there already to to deal with the data to to look at it. Not every country has such great think tanks as India, and 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 so um, that's also still a bottleneck. I think we I, we go through and the CDM as well developed a lot of capacities, not only on the policy level. I would say but also really on the industry level on the ground level how to monitor how to verify data and how to transfer it and how to 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 bring it together so the capacity development is also a very important part and i think it's important to invest into this as well we should not say it shouldn't it's not allowed to cost anything i think the data really needs to cost also some money yeah. Thank you very much. And with this, we open the discussion to you. We have about 20 minutes time for your questions. So yeah, if you're ready, first questions, one moment. Please tell your name and to who you address the question, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Julia Both of the National Designated Entity of Germany, um, being the focal point under the technology mechanism in Germany. Um, so I'm addressing two quick questions, one to NACAC and one to uh, Mr. Ghosh. Um, first of all, thank you all for your excellent presentation. It's always good to see industry and business out, 
at the climate conference presenting so openly and being a part of what's being discussed here, always important to take it away from the policy level as well. Um, to NACEC, my question is, you uh, talked a lot about how you addressed the ministries and how you reached out to other countries, which is great, and I think it's a great model to say um, we will finance a certain point and at uh, point X you have to do it on your own. Um, but how will you actually get the industry involved? How will you get the companies involved? How will you get them to see their own mm -hmm. um, incentives in what you're doing and what the ministry is doing? Because in many countries, um, ministries can say one thing and the companies will still do another. And then to Mr. Ghosh, just a quick question about the data you presented on F gases on the refrigeration air conditioning sector. Were those direct emission, indirect emission, uh, accumulated direct, indirect emissions, and the mitigation potential, is that for direct emissions or indirect emission or an accumulated <laughs> approach? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I would say for time reasons, we take uh, two more questions and then we will uh, let the speakers answer. Thank you. Um, Kanika Chavla from the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, and my question is for Mr. Robertus. And it's actually a follow-on question to what we just heard. Um, Mr. Harvest said that uh, businesses need to realize why it's in their best interest to be sustainable, but to what extent is um, the use of public money to help businesses transition um, sort of in violation of that principle? And for how many technologies are we going to keep doing that? For how many transitions are we going to use public money to get businesses to transition to what should be in their best interest and, and for them to sort of be first movers on new markets? I'm Natalie Bennett. I'm here with the Green Economics Institute, although for full um, declaration, I used to be leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. Uh, and I'm also going to address the question to Mr. Robertus, although it is also a broader question for all of you. And it's a question about data, because I was just thinking about the program you were suggesting, you know, isn't it great that Germany's offering to fund all of this and it will cut emissions on one side, the emissions from the factory. But I was just looking up it was a study that came out two years ago that showed that um, nitrogen-based fertilisers on farms were producing far more nitrous oxide uh, outcomes than had actually been recognised. And so it's a question that then applies to all of you, is as well as just looking to where you get to the point of the factory gate or even if you get to the household with you, Mr Ghosh, um, shouldn't you have the data and be aware of what impact your end use of your product is having? And, you know, I just put out a question on Twitter saying, you know, great, we're making this nitrogen fertiliser more effective, cheaper, and if we produce more of it, actually you could very easily end up with a far worse outcome. Maybe a question to Alonaba and Enrico, who of you would like to start? Okay, I'll, I'll answer the f first question uh, simply. the. We looked at direct and indirect, indirect, and then even in terms of the emissions reduction, we are looking at direct and indirect, especially um, post Kigali amendment. We are looking at not just, you see, India has not yet started using HFC. So it's, so the real story was, if we ever got, on, got onto that track, then do we have the, you know, say the, the leakage, the system maintenance, et cetera. It's not so much how many HFC or, or, or any kind of refrigerant grasses you're producing, it's how it is being managed and are there any indirect impacts from there. So we are trying to account for that. In fact, one of the, again, my colleague Shikha Vaseen, who's been looking at this is uh, creating an R&D platform in India across companies to try and minimize these kind of uh, across the life cycle uh, uh, emissions. Um, and, and to Natalie's question about the potential perverse use of data or the potential perverse outcomes uh, of sincere use of data is absolutely right, which is why you've got to keep doing it again and again. Um, so for instance, our access data set uh, on, on energy access, uh, which as I said, is the largest in the world, uh, we have, of course, been able to help the government of India and state governments drill down to at a household level to do what has to be done. But we are constantly trying to upgrade that data and re redo the surveys, improve the methodologies, etc. But that's one thing. The other aspect is I gave the example very quickly on solar irrigation, for instance. Now I can you know, map out where solar pumps can be deployed. I can get maximum returns on investment and so forth. But one of the things we are most concerned about, just as Jorge was mentioning, 
is, you know, if I give solar-based electricity, do I end up making water even cheaper for the farmer and what is going to be the ground table, uh, uh, groundwater table consequence? So this, uh, you're not just triangulating different sources of data, but you're squaring off between different types of uh, concerns, which is where it comes back to the SDGs. Unless you are connecting the dots on the pathway to the goals, the, uh, then, you know, the achievement of individual goals might make it harder to achieve other goals. So the pathway itself has to be consistent. Okay, thanks a lot for all the good questions. I start with the NDE uh, question. Um, of course, the industry is involved and it's very important. And we have a very important partner already in the initiative is the German Chemical Association, um, who also invited us here today to be on the panel. And we're very glad to have them on board. And um, we have also together with the Chemical Association already reached out to all the global associations, um, informing them about the initiative. And we really are um, in each country as well. Of course, we start also the government negotiations. It's very important to have the government on board. But equally important certainly is the, the, um, to involve the industry. And, and let me tell you, I've been talking now to several government environment ministries. And they're always like at the third point, first point, they say, OK, we need to talk to our industry first. We can't sign anything before we have discussed with them and see how they react to this uh, initiative and how they think this proposal we, we have here on the table is is it good for them or not. So I really also think in, in our partner countries, the, the awareness of having the industry on board is very strong and, and for us very important, of course. And um, to, to the second part of the question, what's in it for the industry, I think in this particular sector, the industry is very aware of their product. I mean, they have a, and I come later to your question, which is very important as well, but in, in, in the terms of uh, climate change, uh, nitric acid production is really harmful. And, um, and I think also the CDM again, I'm always coming back to the CDM, but the CDM also was able to, to um, raise awareness in the sector because I think the CDM was really able to, to show the industry, okay, we have a product here which has a byproduct which is really, really harmful for the, for the, for the climate. And um, I think many of the industrialists have realized that the future of their product really is also depending on uh, to produce it in a more sustainable manner. And I also think that many governments, again, now with the Paris Agreement and, and the NDEs will, um, NDCs will um, now start to think, okay, which sectors are we tackling first and which is a good sector to start with? And of course, this sector is a good sector to start with. I'll give you an example. Uh, we're talking to Georgia and, um, and in Georgia, we have one nitric acid plant and this one nitric acid plant is responsible for 5% of the emissions of Georgia. So this is really a, a nice thing to do for a government. So I really think um, on both sides we have a lot of interest. And for the for the industry, um, it's interesting to, of course, say now, no, we. If you if you're a little bit mi more midterm perspective thinking, then you probably think, okay, we take the support now, we get all the capacities going to to install the equipment and to keep it running and to be able to monitor it and to run it. And, and we do it now, and maybe this comes now two or three years earlier than, than we would have to do when our own government comes, comes with this. Um, so I think it's a good proposition also for the industry to, to start now and take, take the support and, and then for the long term be responsible, of course, for the mitigation themselves. So that's the proposition to the industry. And then thanks for your question on um, how, how, how long can we invest public money to um, to, um, to, to support the industry, make their, their products more sustainable. I think it's always important to look at each sector. And in this case, um, we have a very clearly case on additionality. So the industry really has no reason to do this because it's really not harming their product at all, their production at all. Um, um, these emissions are just um, completely byproducts and um, they can produce a nice uh, nitric acid product and, and they don't have to care about it. So. Um, what I want to say, there's no incentive for the industry to do so. So if they install the technology, it's just a burden. It's more costs and it's, it's more hassle and it, it, it evolves. And you have to convince the, the engineers to, to uh, put a catalyst into their process. And that's not always easy, of course, and, and so on. So it's, it's really, there's no, no incentive for the industry. Of course, you can come now and say, we regulate and we tell you to do it. That's one way to do it. You can also say now, follow an approach which we have to say, we, we give some handholding, we support. Um, also in terms of money, but then we have to say um, this is very well invested money in terms of climate change because the ton 
uh, equal, uh, of CO2 equivalent is around 2 to $3. So it's, it's a really good um, investment in terms of climate change mitigation. We spend a lot of money on other sectors where, where tons are much higher in the price if you look at the marginal abatement. So, and we can even show some pre-2020 action, which is very important for us as well. Yeah? So we can um, drastically already till 2020, if everything works out in developing countries, the potential for mitigation is 200 million tons. So it's, it's a big number. So we think it's a good investment, especially if you talk, and this is climate finance. It's, it's um, public money, which the German government has already declared to spend, and we think it's a very wise investment in this case to spend it in this sector. And um, yeah, and then the last question, I also really liked it that you asked it, because I often try to, at the time wasn't there, but try to also explain, of course, all of you on this is um, surely, um, I didn't say that the nitric acid goes mostly into the fertilizer production. That's the main um, reason why it's produced. And um, of course, um, fertilizers are, have a lot of other bad environmental impacts. I can say that. I mean, coming from GZ, working in the environment department, there's a lot of other ne negative impacts. But um, on the other hand, we also know that this product um, is a product which will be used for the next decades. That's for sure as well, because it supports us to to um, 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 have environment, uh, to have food security, and and that's in also in the in the um, of course in the responsibility of the own countries. It's a very sensitive product as well. If you talk about fertilizers, because um, um, of course it's always food security. I just wanted to finish with this that we also of course think in the end, in the long term, for decarbonization in 2050, we need new products. We need organic farming, but maybe that's not the only solution. Thank you. So we come to a last set of three questions. So Russell, and then here's a question behind. Yes. So Russell. Thank you. Great panel. Uh, Russell Mills. I, I work for SIF, Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which looks to support low carbon transitions, especially in developing countries. I have a specific question and a general question. My specific question is to Enrico. Um, th this sounds like a, a sort of a good news and bad news story. So I, I wanted to understand how you, the individual 32 countries, were going to commit to transparency, and I mean real transparency. Some would, will do it very well, which would be good to know about, others maybe less well. How will you handle the transparency? And my more general question to, to all of the panel is, if you look at climate change in the short to medium term, it's more of a societal issue in terms of water impacts and air impacts and, and so on and so on. So if you had to pick one technology uh, which would have the biggest societal positive impact within the chemical industry, what, what, what technology or innovation example would you pick? Something which society understands. I mean, catalysis is fantastic, but many in society don't understand that. Are there some other examples in the chemical industry which would really demonstrate how society would benefit from what you're doing? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm with uh, Fertilizer Canada, which is the industry association representing the fertilizer industry. And I'd just like to respond to a few things that you said about nitric acid. First of all, the Canadian industry and most modern uh, fertilizer industries have had for many, many years N2O abatement equipment, non-selective non catalytic reduction, um, which is, uh, reduces the N2O to a very, very minute amount. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, in terms of uh, fertilizer. Just put your mic. Oh, sorry. In terms of fertilizer, uh, it is used to grow food. Uh, half of the food produced in the world is the result of uh, fertilizer. Uh, and so if we're going to have emissions, it should be probably emissions related to food production rather than uh, other things. And so we all have to make choice about where the emissions go. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, our industry is making very strong efforts to increase the efficient use of fertilizer on farms, which would make a massive reduction in the emissions uh, when fertilizer, <coughs> nitrogen fertilizer is applied. And products made with nitric acid are really not very different in their uh, emissions profile once they go in the, uh, in the soil. So I just thought I'd let set those things straight. Thank you. Any further question? Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to ask questions and thanks for the very good presentation. My name is Sunday Leonard. 
and I work with the scientific and technical advisory panel to the Global Environment Facility in Washington, D.C. Uh, my question goes to Yoji on, you spoke about the role of the chemical industry and highlighted how they can contribute to the different sustainable development goals. But f the way I see your presentation only shows what you can do. You can produce fertilizer to improve food security and so on. But you you have not addressed, in my opinion, what you are doing that is detrimental to the sustainable development goals and how your industry is going to address that. Um, so you some of the chemicals, um, for example, the, uh, persistent organic pollutants, mercury and so on, have so much impact and a lot of resources is going into mitigating their impact. Conventions are created because of that and we need the chemical industry to come up with solutions. So it means changing the way you do things and so on. So, but, so I'm wondering what is the what is the move that the chemical industry is trying to make in also addressing their own negative impact on achieving both the climate goals as well as the sustainable development goals thank you yeah, so so all the question to Jorge and uh, Stefan about of course the contribution and the solutions uh, to society of the chemical sector uh, but of course, also, what are the next steps uh, to to live up to even more challenges, which are of course still still there? Shall I begin? Okay, maybe it also addressing, even though it was George's question, but um, addressing the last part of your question. I mean, um, yes, I mean we have a lot of substances that are critical um, in chemical processes. So. I guess what is really important here is that we differentiate in our business model saying, okay, there, are, there is a, a huge uh, potential lying in bio-based materials on the one hand side, but we will always have uh, an advantage on the part of polymer-based um, materials or others. But in, in, in those parts where we have to deal with critical um, uh, substances, that we close the loops and close the circles. And this is not all, again, this is not all uh, only a, um, a matter of technology, it's a matter of the business model. Whether I sell bleaches or I sell bleached papers and take back the rest makes a big difference. So I have a problem saying there is something like green chemistry, I guess there is a you know, there is a traditional or a polymer or oil-based chemi uh, chemistry, and there is a bio-based um, chemistry, but we can find solutions for both ways. Last point here, because this is closely linked to that, um, is that when it comes to the capacities and or to these uh, circularity and all those solutions, it is absolutely plain to see that uh, those challenges are too big for just one company or one industry to face. So again, this is why those platforms that we have um, with ICCA or with uh, the World Business Council and other platforms, why this is so absolutely uh, important to have, to come to shared solutions and maybe to better learn how to share the knowledge and the data and the, the insights that we have as, as companies with other others, which is extremely difficult because this is knowledge that we for a long time and for decades kept as a well-hidden secret. Maybe this is something that we can learn from uh, a new digital economy, how to better deal with those things on open platforms or more open platforms and corporations. Yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, first, uh, related to technology side, uh, uh, Russell's, uh, I would say that uh, the one that uh, in Brazil, in Brazil, I mean, the, the one that we, in Brazil we have selected is the bio-based uh, production. Uh, because there we have land, there we have also water, insulation, so it's, there is prepared for that. that. That kind of technology probably is not the ones that will be used in, in North Europe. Uh, I don't know. So yeah, I think that this is also related to the local and how the business is organized in that uh, region. So there is not a solution for the, the same solution for everywhere. 
Uh, in this kind of uh, thinking, I think that we, have, we should consider what was said before, that we should take a look at the whole life cycle of the products and, and, and also consider the all kind of impacts. Of course, I agree with you, we sh there is always some a negative impact. Uh, even, in, for example, in the production of the bio-based products, they in Brazil will use 1.5 uh, percentage of the whole arable land to produce ethanol that is fueling uh, the old, all the cars, we could say. And that kind of uh, raw material are used to produce chemicals also. There is also the, 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 the impact, negative impact of land use, of course. But then we have, uh, there we have a lot of land. 1.5% is not a big deal. So uh, is, there is always um, a, a, a different, uh, different uh, situation in each country. Uh, and I could say that uh, for, then the society should decide, that society should decide where to put effort on, 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 on improving the impacts and also the positive and the, the negative side. On the, the whole, on the whole um, uh, looking to the whole um, chemicals, um, safety uh, management, as you were mentioning, uh, of course, as, as Stefan said, we have a lot of uh, products that are, uh, uh, they have some risks. They are hazard products. Uh, so you have to manage that risk. And in order to support that, ICCA has a strong com uh, commitment on that. There is a program called Global Product uh, uh, Strategy that, that together with UN Environment, probably you already know, at this strategic approach for international chemical manage management, we are supporting the whole movement, global movement on that. If you look in the, the website of uh, ICCA, you will find uh, this specific, specific data bank of risk of uh, thousands of products, that is how we could uh, help the whole, all the countries to manage the products, this, the, the risk of the products. There is no uh, situation, there is no risk. All the products, even water, has a risk. So uh, you, we have to manage that. Thank you very much. And one last question from my side to all panelists. Coming back to COP23, we are now in the first week, the second week uh, is coming. If you would have one wish free to, to the governments, what is the one result you really would like to see at the end of the negotiations? Mr. Havers, if you would like to start. Not to open the gap between industrialized countries and developing countries too far, but to close that gap. Uh, I'd like to see the new CDM going forward. Um, I'll try to respond to your question and the question that Russell asked, uh, even though it's a tough one. Um, the, your question, I, Andrea, I would argue, um, what, do we, what should we aim for at the end of these negotiations, this round, is actually greater transparency. I mean, the Paris Agreement uh, will only work if its transparency mechanism is significantly different from all other climate accords that have come in the past. Without that, you don't get trust. Without trust, you don't get market confidence. Without market confidence, you don't get investment. Um, and uh, you get stuck in, 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 the, in the past. Uh, to Russell's question, what is one technology uh, that would, for the chemical industry, that would have maximum impact across the SDGs? Now, I'm now completely in, you know, uncertain terrain because I'm neither a chemist nor uh, you know an expert on all the SDGs. But I will say this, uh, the future is going to be uh, quite a bit decentralized, significantly de digitalized, and eventually decarbonized. Now if that, if you accept that proposition and you work backwards from there and you look at the range of SDGs, you see what is the one SDG that could have maximum impact across other SDGs, and then how do we map this template? It, over the course of the last about four or five decades of development literature, uh, the one metric that has the biggest impact across countries and longitudinal surveys have revealed is girls' education. That delivers access to incomes, access to energy, range of things. Okay. So if I take those 17 and I come down to goals four and five, that is universal education and gender equality, then how do we get faster, quicker, better access to girls' education 
uh, using that decentralized, digitalized, decarbonized approach. One of the significant barriers to girls' education in developing countries is the lack of clean water and sanitation facilities in schools, along with a lack of energy. So what can the chemicals industry do to deliver decentralized, affordable, clean water? Is it going to be nanotechnology to take really horrible water in, 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 in distributed areas and clean them up at the primary school level? Uh, or are we going to be transporting water from large distances, which we've not managed to do? So I've tried to break down the problem. But if we want to get SDGs, we've got to get girls educated. We want to get girls educated, we've got to get them clean water in schools. So that's the problem set for the chemicals industry. OK, so uh, I have many wishes uh, for the government, um, but I'm going to address a wish uh, that I have for the audience here. So next up in around four minutes, that's why I'm going to run off in a second, we have an event at the German Pavilion about uh, GHG neutrality and the role of German business, um, where actually five company representatives and a researcher from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research are discussing uh, the role of, uh, of business in achieving GHG neutrality and also address something that we came up here, the business case for that. So, um, yeah, I will hope many of you follow. Thanks. Uh, okay, real quick, um, a more personal thing. Uh, I'm, I'm really attached to Article 6, which is about uh, cooperation between the com uh, countries, and I would love to see progress there and, and support it very heavily. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the, the main word uh, we have heard today is trust. A lot has already been done. We heard many examples from the chemical industry where they brought already solutions. Adonaba has uh, some extra uh, such a, some ideas on how to go forward. I'm, I know Ika and Kimi who, uh, Free has, has also some ideas. So, But we also know that it's not possible alone. It's not only business. It's not only uh, sector-wise. It's everybody together. We need to connect the dot. We heard that several times, the con uh, connected dots amongst sectors, but also uh, amongst uh, every stakeholder group. We need uh, the science people more involved. We need the data, best practices, what is possible. And of course, we need to look into who has not the capacity and, and see with who can, can we partner more and increase our partnership and become more open. And of course, digitalization is already part of our life and will be even more our life. So again, a great thank you to all our excellent panelists and thanks to you for the great questions. And um, we wish you a rest, a uh, nice day at the COP23. And you heard Laura's event. German Pavilion is just straight ahead. So please join the event. Thank you. Thank you.